We are uh, tonight talking about the civil law, uh, sometimes called the judicial law, and this is in the context of the Mosaic Covenant, the law that God gave to the nation of Israel through Moses. And one of the things that we want to bear in mind that we've mentioned a number of times before is that while historically Christians have recognized kind of three categories within the Mosaic Law, the civil, the ceremonial, and the moral, and while we can understand the contents of the law under those three headings, we do need to bear in mind that the law itself is not organized according to those three headings. So it's not as though you can read in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and say, here is a section of moral law, here is a section of civil law, here is a section of ceremonial law. Most of the material in those four books in the Pentateuch are going to be some combination of the three categories. Now that's not always true, because you could argue that the, much of the material that we looked at last week with regard to the uh, ceremonial law and the sacrificial system particularly, that those units are pretty thoroughly religious law. But when we deal with the regulations of the civil society, what we're going to see tonight is that really these regulations are but applications of God's universal moral principles. So that it's a much harder thing to parse out the distinction between the civil law or the judicial law and the moral law. The moral law is what continues to be binding on people today. The moral law was... Uh, true prior to the time of Moses, and it's been true since the time of Moses. It is equally applicable to Jews and to Gentiles. But not so the civil law. God gave the nation of Israel a law to govern the commonwealth, to govern their society as a political institution. And we need to recognize that, that when we're reading through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we are reading laws that are addressed to a particular nation at a particular point in history in a particular context, that being primarily the context of Canaan dwelling within the Promised Land. There are many of these regulations, some that we saw over the last couple of weeks with regard to the religious instructions, but many of the regulations that we'll look at tonight with regard to the civil ordinances, many of those things could not effectively be obeyed or implemented outside of Canaan. I mean, you just can't... What is the meaning of having rules about a parapet on the roof of your house if you don't have a house? Right? So when you're in the wilderness living in a tent, that law doesn't really have any application. Similarly, when you are exiled to Babylon, you can't really go to the temple anymore and worship. And so the law that was given to Israel has a particular historical context. And we need to recognize that. That law was to expire and be fulfilled. And the various categories of the law were fulfilled in various ways. I've given you some material here at the introduction to the outline that I'm not going to develop tonight. But if you will take the time to look at those passages, you'll notice that in the New Testament, Jesus and the apostles do not regard the Gentile Christians to be under the civil ordinances of the nation of Israel. Instead, what the apostles uniformly instruct the churches to do is to obey the civil magistrates, the governing authorities, that at that time were Romans, right? And their law is not very consistent with the law of Moses, but nevertheless, that was the civil law that they found themselves under. The civil law that was given to Israel through Moses would expire when Jesus died on the cross and when ultimately at AD 70, that nation as a political institution ceased to exist. The ceremonial aspects of that law and the covenant terms would be fulfilled in Christ and His offering of Himself eliminates the need for a further temple or holy day or sacrificial or priestly system, right? The moral law continues to obligate all people throughout the world, right? 
but the way in which that moral law is going to be applied is going to differ somewhat depending on particular circumstances. And we can even talk about that more next week. So we need to recognize that while the Mosaic Covenant is a cohesive unit, there are categories within it that can be discerned and that are disposed of in various ways. Does that make sense? Okay, so all of that I think is important background for the material that we'll look at tonight. So let's begin with prayer and ask God's blessing on our time and then we'll start marching through some of this civil material. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for this day, for the blessing of strength that you've given us, for a sufficient measure of health to be together tonight, and now for the opportunity to open your word and to study from it to reflect upon the ordinances that you gave to the nation of Israel that demonstrate the transcendent moral principles that are to govern all nations. We pray, Father, for wisdom and for discernment, even as we examine the text that will be before us tonight. Help us, Lord, that we might see the way in which even these civil ordinances point us ahead to Jesus Christ and bless us and strengthen and help us in that study, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to open your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 17, that's where we're going to begin tonight with thinking about the rules for government and specifically the rules that are given by Moses in anticipation of the installation of a monarchy. In other words, a king over the nation of Israel. Now, Israel was a theocracy, not a monarchy. And a theocracy, of course, is a government that is supposed to be divinely governed, right? God is Israel's king. But all the way back in the uh, uh, Deuteronomic literature, when Israel is gathered together on the eastern banks of the Jordan River and they're preparing to enter into the Promised Land, as far back as the time of Moses, God has already prophesied and predicted that one day Israel will have a king. And it is not altogether inappropriate that this was so. Uh, it, this is not God saying, unfortunately, one day you will have a king. But he's saying, one day I will set a king over you. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But if you look here in Deuteronomy chapter 17, in verse 14, notice how the text is introduced. When you come to the land that Yahweh your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations are, that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom Yahweh your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since Yahweh has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear Yahweh his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel." Now, one of the things that you notice as you move into the historical literature in 1 Samuel chapter 5 is that the very circumstances that God predicts here in Deuteronomy 17 are the circumstances that do, in fact, come to pass. The children of Israel are dissatisfied with the theocratic government that God has appointed for them. They are particularly dissatisfied with the fact that Samuel, at that time, is aging and his sons are not like him, and so they want a king in order to be like the nations around them. They want to be like the world in which they live, and that is continually the struggle. We talked about this, I think, two weeks ago when we started introducing the ceremonial law and talked about the warning that God gives to the people in Deuteronomy not to worship 
him the way that the pagans worship their gods. Don't learn worship practices from pagans. And in a similar way, the people of God were not to learn government from the world around them. And yet God knows at a particular point in their history, that's exactly what they will do. They will want a king. And the Lord says here in Deuteronomy 17, you may have a king. You may indeed set a king over yourself. So that's not outside of the permissive will of God. But the Lord says, there's a particular king that I will place over you. In other words, you can appoint a king, but it's going to need to be a king that I choose. And this king is going to need to meet certain criteria. For instance, he is to be an Israelite, not a foreigner. And he is to be careful with regard to certain transgressions and pitfalls, not to accumulate horses, not to acquire many wives, not to be greedy and accumulate great wealth. And it seems like, at least in the historical literature of the Old Testament, most of Israel's kings disregarded all of those warnings. Uh, the king was to write a personal copy of the law and to really dwell upon that. And did you notice there at the end of the reading that this was in order to keep him humble? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That part of the function of devotion to the Scriptures is to keep leaders from being exalted over their brethren, but to keep them mindful of the fact that they are of the brethren. And, and even though this is a secondary application, and I'm not trying to stretch the text too far, I would say the same thing ought to be true of officers in the church today. Leaders within the church. The same ought to be true of parents within the home. Devotion to the Word of God ought to serve the purpose, among several purposes, but it ought to serve the purpose of keeping us humble. In other words, if you study the Bible and your heart is lifted up with pride, you're doing it wrong. Right? Studying Scripture should keep us mindful of the fact not that we are something special and have been elevated by God to a position of responsibility, but rather to make us mindful of the fact that we ourselves are part of the brethren who are under the leadership of our God. Uh, the Israelites were warned as well uh, to respect the king that God would place over them. Uh, all the way back in Exodus, in fact, Moses instructs the people never to curse a ruler of the people, right? And that would not be limited to the kings. Uh, we would see even in Acts chapter 23. No? Yes, chapter 23, that Paul uh, recognizes when he oversteps in addressing the chief priest in a disrespectful way. It is an unintentional error, it's an inadvertent mistake, and yet he repents of it because it is written, you shall not speak against a ruler of the people. And so even the priests would, uh, would be uh, within that category. Does that make sense? Now, there's a lot to think about there. What we're going to have to do tonight, just like we've been doing the last two weeks and will the next two weeks, I'm trying to give you the big picture. I'm trying to give you an overview. But I do hope that uh, thinking about those regulations in anticipation of the monarchy will help you in terms of studying the historical literature in Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles particularly and to see ultimately the failure of Israel's kings in light of this teaching in Deuteronomy and to see the way in which Christ fulfills these expectations perfectly. Right, And so even this aspect of the civil law points us ahead in kind of a Christological fashion. Does that make sense? Now, Deuteronomy talks as well a lot about laws with regard to warfare. This is over in Deuteronomy chapter 20, and you'll see that most of the texts that are referenced in your study guide is, are from Deuteronomy. And again, that's not uh, any attempt to be exhaustive, uh, but hopefully to be sufficiently complete to give you a good handle on these ideas. A lot more text referenced in the handout than we have time to read, but the majority of the civil laws, we're going to actually look at Deuteronomy uh, as the source of them. So in Deuteronomy chapter 20, you have laws concerning uh, warfare and military engagement. When Israel was preparing to go out to battle, there were specific instructions for the preparation of that. One of the interesting things is that the priest was to address the people, and then also the officers, the commanders of the army were to address 
address the people. And they were to give specific encouragements and then specific instructions. So the priest is to come and to remind the officers and and soldiers of God's presence and and to to be mindful that we're the people of God as we're going out into battle. This is not just a uh, kind of a nationalistic, uh, religious-driven war speech, right? But it's recognizing that even as we proceed onto the battlefield, we are to be the people of God. And we are to be a light to the nations. That's a really fascinating aspect of this instruction, I think. Uh, Then the officers were to step forward and to begin identifying those who might have been mustered with the army but ought to go home rather than be deployed, as it were. So, for instance, a man who had built a new house but had not dedicated it. Or someone who had planted a vineyard but had not yet eaten of its fruit. Those who were engaged but not yet married. Those who were afraid... Now, what does it say about a nation that this provision would be in its law code that before you go to battle, the commander needs to step forward and tell the soldiers, anyone who is afraid of where we're going and what we're about to do, you're excused. Now... You can, you, I mean, we could argue about whether there is some kind of psychology at play here. I don't actually think so, though. It may have functioned that way in terms of actual application. Maybe some soldiers are, are bolstered by that or unwilling to acknowledge their fear. I think this is completely legitimate, though. And I think we actually see this playing itself out in Judges chapter 6 and 7 during the time of Gideon. Why doesn't God want soldiers that are afraid going into battle? The simple answer is that He doesn't need any of them. He doesn't need any of them. He doesn't need the fearful ones, but He also doesn't need the courageous ones. This is a recognition that the battle belongs to the Lord and that God is the one who is going to fight the battle and that God is the one who is going to win the victory. What kind of strength, what kind of encouragement does that give to the army as they go out. Remember, they are reminded of God's presence and then as they proceed with this deployment, they are reminded that largely we're immaterial. You know, And it's not that we're unimportant to God, it's just that we're not necessary for victory on the battlefield. That should provide some encouragement. When they were preparing to battle a city that was far away, the uh, Israelites were to offer them terms of peace. Obviously, this has a specific historical context. Right? The assumption is that Israel's army is going to be operating within the territory of Canaan. Right? And so if you are going to battle against a faraway city beyond your borders, then you are to offer terms of peace. And if they accept those terms of peace, then that nation, that city-state really, is effectively subjugated to Israel. They would be Israel's servants or slaves. By the way, that doesn't necessarily mean slaves in your household. It just simply means that that city-state would be put in submission to Israel. They would continue, presumably, to occupy their own territory, but they would pay tribute to Israel, recognizing that Israel has superiority over them. If the city refused to surrender, then the city was to be besieged. And after the siege, all of the men were to be killed. And the rest of the inhabitants, as well as the possessions, were to be taken as spoil. And there are uh, extensive uh, instructions about that even beyond Deuteronomy chapter 20. Interestingly, during a siege, um, only non-fruit-bearing trees were to be cut down. Now, this is not a type of warfare that we're familiar with, right? So uh, you, don't, you don't learn about siege warfare in modern military uh, 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 courses much anymore, at least. Uh, but in siege warfare, you would want to cut trees down in order to build siege works as well as prepare battering rams and things of that nature. And why wouldn't you cut down the fruit trees? Because those are, those are food sources, right? And there is a recognition that God is the Lord of the harvest and that what we're trying to do here is not actually decimate this area, we're simply trying to win the battle. We're trying to overcome the enemy. Uh, And the law in Deuteronomy chapter 23 provides very explicit regulations with, uh, with regard to military deployments in terms of the camp and the cleanliness that is to be observed in the camp. Now one of the things that's important to know as you move into Joshua is that the cities, the city states that were within the borders of Canaan, there was not to be peace treaties with them. There was, there was to be complete annihilation. There was to be total uh, destruction and occupation of those territories. 
And that becomes important in Joshua chapter 9. But we're not in Joshua chapter 9, so you'll have to look that up on your own. All right, does that make sense? We're moving quickly, I know, but uh, that's that's on purpose right now. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter... Oh, Dick, I'm sorry. I'm trying to pay attention here, but my mind is wandering... That's okay. Yes. And the difference in military strategy. Yes. Um, big difference. Huge. Absolutely. Completely different. And again, part of what we're seeing here is the difference in terms of historical context. And if we take, and, and there are some who would do this, I think it's a mistake, but if we take Deuteronomy and say, okay, this is the way that warfare is to be conducted by any nation in any context, well, re- we're really taking Scripture out of context. This has a particular historical context. Now, what I do want to get to, and this is one of the reasons I'm hastening, (laughs) is I do want to talk about the principle of general equity. Okay, How how then do we use these civil laws? Is this largely irrelevant material? I don't think it's irrelevant. I think it's very helpful. But if it's not supposed to be applied directly and exactly as it was given to Israel, how then is it properly used? And I think that's where the principle of general equity comes in. Uh, but, but you're right. In, in a modern context, we can see profound differences, you know, sometimes appropriately so, by the way. I wouldn't want our nation to conduct warfare the way that the Israelites were supposed to conduct warfare in Canaan. Yeah. Right? Think about it for a second. Yeah. I wouldn't want that. Okay? So I would say appropriate differences there. At the same time, I would say many times modern military methods and strategies differ from this in... in uh, disadvantageous ways, in inappropriate ways, right? Um, so again, that's, that's going to be part of the conversation with regard to the general equity. All right, let's think about the, the judicial system at, in, properly, right? We said all of this can be referred to as the judicial law, but the judicial system properly with regard to crime in the community. There were standing courts, if you will. There were uh, elders and judges that were appointed over the people even during the wilderness period and those judges would continue to serve uh, the nation even after the invasion and conquest and occupation of Canaan. Uh, those system, That system of judges we saw in Exodus chapter 18, I told you, is proto-Presbyterianism. And I wasn't joking when I said that. I know that you know it seems like a joke. Uh, it seems like kind of a silly argument to make at this point. Uh, but actually, that's a that's a significant argument for uh, the Presbyterian view of church government. Uh, the Presbyterian view of church government is derived from what we believe to be the teaching of Scripture, both in the New Testament with regard to the church and in the Old Testament with regard to Israel. Right? And what do we see? We see a system of tiered courts. We see a plurality and parity among the leaders. We do not see a system like the Roman Catholic hierarchy. We do not see something like a papal or episcopal model. What we have, and you could actually argue that during Moses' time that's almost what you have because you do seem to have one central leader, but recognize that's a special circumstance that is not perpetuated in the law, right? What you have instead is you have groups of qualified men who are gifted by God's Spirit leading the congregation and then various levels of courts, as it were, so that cases can be appealed And this plays a profound role in the founding of our nation, by the way, right? Uh, The King of England at one point refers to the American problem, the problem in the American colonies, as a Presbyterian problem, right? Because this, this shapes the political thought of not all, but many of our founders, right? And uh, this system of checks and balances. And so that, that is an important part of the judicial law or the civil law that we see in the book of Deuteronomy as well as historically in the book of Exodus. So if you are not receiving satisfaction from the judges that are functioning over you, the lesser magistrate, the lower magistrates, then there is an opportunity for appeal. Ultimately, when a sentence is decreed, that judgment is final. Now, that's accounting for the appeals process. But you get to a point where you say judgment has been rendered. Whether that's gone all the way up the food chain to the chief priest or not, uh, there, is, there is a judgment that's been made, and that is final, uh, uh, final, 
And contempt could even be punished by death. And so there is a respect for the integrity and the authority of the judicial system. And, uh, and that's very, very important. Um, <sighs> I'm thinking about getting myself in trouble there. Um, you know, this, this is why you know, we do have to have respect for uh, civil authority. That's not to say that civil authority cannot act outside of the bounds of justice. Obviously they can, and they do. And yet, we don't have the option of simply saying, well, then I just pretend like that never happened, right? And so that, that's an issue that has to be balanced, and, uh, and there's a lot of discernment uh, biblically that needs to go into thinking through those issues. Uh, in terms of fairness in the judicial process, if you go over to Deuteronomy chapter 16, and again, there are numerous proof texts here that we can look at, but Deuteronomy chapter 16, beginning at verse 18, Moses says to the people, You shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that Yahweh your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. You shall not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that Yahweh your God is giving you. Isn't that a beautiful, strong, powerful charge? Now you can say, well, but, but uh, these systems are prone to abuse. Of course they're prone to abuse, right? But again, this is part of the reason that there is this Presbyterian model. And I don't mean that in a denominational sense right now. I mean that in the technical sense. Elder-led communities of faith. That's what you're seeing here, right? Every town has a plurality of elders and those elders are themselves accountable to other elders in the region. And those elders are themselves accountable to the system of government in the nation as a whole. And there is plurality and there is parity. In other words, equality, right? There's not one guy dictating to the rest. There is a group of men in this tiered system, all of whom are charged to do justice, all of whom are accountable. That's what Presbyterianism is. That's what it means, right? It's just the Greek word for elders or elder-led in this case. And the law was to serve justice for everyone, including the disadvantaged in society. The poor were not given preferential treatment because of their poverty. But neither were the wealthy given preferential treatment because of their wealth, right? This is to be an equal system. And you don't create equality by tipping the scales the opposite direction, right? Uh, and that's, that's unfortunately the modern uh, conversation that has been had now for years. Is to say, well, the wealthy and the powerful have an advantage in our system, so somehow we need to tilt it the other way. That's, that's not how you achieve equality, <laughs> right? Um, Unfortunately, you have sinful fallen people involved in these systems, and so they're always prone to abuse. But that's why you need to have this kind of a system where there is plurality, right? And there is parity, and there is an opportunity for appeal, and the system, therefore, has some means of preserving its own integrity. In chapter 19, if you go just a page or two over, and you look at verse 15, you see one of the most important principles with regard to the criminal law in Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 15, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before Yahweh, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. And the rest shall hear and fear and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. That's the lex talionis. And we're going to talk about that before we're done. That is the basic principle of justice. It remains the basic principle of justice. All right? 
Uh, the idea, though, is that if you are charged with some kind of a criminal offense, you cannot be convicted, apart from your confession of the offense, you cannot be convicted except on the testimony of two or three witnesses, right? There is a careful system of justice that is in place. Does that mean sometimes that guilty people would go free? Yes, it does. But better for that to happen than for the innocent people to be wrongly condemned and wrongly convicted on the basis of insufficient evidence. So what I would say is that at this point, the law of Moses errs on the side of mercy, right, rather than erring on the side of judgment, okay? But when you have a false accusation that is actually discovered and you determine that this man falsely accused his brother and was seeking to harm his brother by that accusation, then whatever the outcome would have been had his brother been convicted, suddenly that is the sentence that falls upon his accuser. And that is intended to cut down on any kind of a malicious charge, right? Notice this, one person accusing another created a criminal trial, right? It's not as though the judges of Israel looked at that and said, well, there's only one of you, therefore we're not going to deal with this. No. If, if my brother brings an, a charge against me, then the judges, the elders, have to assess that, right? But one witness is going to be insufficient. And if that witness proves to be a false witness, woe upon his head, right? And so that is a, that is a profound principle of, of justice, by the way. Not to jump ahead to the conversation about general equity, but what do you see in the New Testament? You see the very same principle being applied in the church. When Paul talks to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, he says that you are not to receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. But those who are guilty of sin, you are to rebuke in the presence of everyone so that the rest also may fear. That's exactly the language that you're seeing in Deuteronomy chapter 19. We take justice very seriously, but we have safeguards to make sure that justice is actually done. And if you're going to err err on the side of letting a guilty man go unconvicted than letting an innocent man be convicted wrongfully. Does that make sense? That's the, that's the way we want the justice system to lean if it's going to lean one way or the other. Now, in terms of punishment, there's a lot more here than we could possibly unpack in one session. So what I've done at this point in the study guide, I've given you some basic principles with a few proof texts and then the specific uh, punishments for specific crimes are dealt with under those headings, and that's in the next section, next major section of your outline. Just broadly speaking, there was no institutionalized incarceration in ancient Israel, or for that matter, in the ancient Near East at this point in time, right? Now, when I say institutionalized incarceration, I'm thinking about something like a prison system, okay? There were forms of incarceration. So, for instance, something that we don't even have time to get into tonight, but uh, that is part of the Mosaic Law, is the principle or the, uh, the provision of the cities of refuge. If you committed manslaughter, which is a different crime than murder, this is an inadvertent, non-malicious taking of a human life, you don't get to simply say, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, you didn't mean to do that, but you were reckless and you are responsible for taking another person's life. You would be incarcerated. Now, what that would look like is until the high priest of that day died, you would be confined to the territory of one of the cities of refuge. You would be safe there. You would be protected by the law there, but you had to live there. You couldn't go outside the borders. If you went outside those borders, you were forfeiting your life. That's not institutional incarceration but it is incarceration. Do you see that? If you are a thief and you're unable to repay not only what you stole, but the restitution that the law prescribes, you would be sold as a slave for up to seven years. <laughs> that's incarceration, right? But it's not institutional incarceration. Do we understand the difference? So that's why I say there's no institutional incarceration in the law of Moses. There are various types of incarceration. Primarily, the law of Moses would punish in some corporal manner with beatings, right? Whippings, 
canings, or in the case of a crap, capital crime, with something like a stoning, which was designed to kill a person, right? Um, could I just say, without getting in trouble, that's not a bad system, by the way, where instead of creating entire communities of convicted criminals and housing and feeding and supporting them uh, uh, you know, by the public commonwealth, you actually punish, exact punishment, right? Or incarcerate in a way that puts the offender to work, right? But in a way that society does not have to continue to support. That's not necessarily a bad thing, right? We may argue that that's impractical at this point in human history, but it worked pretty well for a whole lot of years in human history. Debbie, you had your hand up. That's right. Some people, then they go personal injury. Yes. And what I have struggled with, and I kept on reading it and reading it over with, where the part where it says in verse 20, Yes. Uh, it says a man strikes his male or female slave with a rod. I am going to get there. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, that's coming. Really disturbing. I understand. That's coming. I will. I will get there. I promise. I will not. I will not jump over that. Okay. Um, punishment. Deuteronomy chapter 25 never to be administered without a thorough investigation. If you've got in your mind this barbaric system where people are being beaten and stoned right and left, you don't know what you're thinking about. <laughs> you, don't really, you don't really understand the context of the law. Again, if the Mosaic Law errs judicially, it errs on the side of not punishing a guilty person because of insufficient evidence. And ultimately, in those cases, justice is left to God. That's not a bad thing. If you err judicially, that's the side that you want to err on. Um, if a person was convicted of a crime and was to be whipped or beaten, it was not to exceed 40 blows. Forty is a lot if you're being caned, by the way. But it was the idea of preventing some kind of abusive... By the way, I need to say this. The penalties that are prescribed in the law in almost all cases are the maximum allowed penalty, not the prescribed penalty. And why that's important is no, there was judicial discretion. We see this in the historical books of the Old Testament. Just because a person could be beaten 40 times doesn't mean that everybody who was beaten was beaten 40 times, right? And even in some cases of violent uh, crime where a person's life might be forfeit, the capital uh, punishment would not always be applied. Now, there were cases with regard to premeditated murder where the law appears to take it out of the judge's hands. The murderer's life is forfeited, okay? And there doesn't appear to be an exception to that. But in many, if not most of these cases, as you're reading through Deuteronomy, you need to recognize that what's being described is the maximum allowable penalty to make sure that the judges do not exceed what is prescribed, not pronouncing in every case kind of a cookie-cutter approach to justice. Does that make sense? So there's still room for judicial discretion, and, and we'll deal with this uh, in a minute with violent crime. Yes, sir? Do we know how many stripes Jesus got? Uh, no, because the Romans beat him, and they don't have any regulations about that. <laughs> yeah, but Paul, when he talks about being beaten, uh, he, will, he will refer to 40 lashes save one. The Jews of the, of the first century would beat you 39 times to make sure that if they miscounted, they hadn't broken the law. Right? So that's kind of a Pharisaic hedge around the law. Sometimes an executed criminal's body would be put on public display, but it could not be put on display for longer than that day, and by sundown the body had to be taken down and buried. Again, I'm telling you, this is not a bad system. Right? You publicly execute someone and hang his body up for the next four or six hours, that makes an impact. But even in death, the criminal is treated with a measure of dignity. That's important. And we ought to do the same, right? He's not dragged through the streets. He's not made a pinata, right? He is, he is made an example for the community, and then he is treated with the respect and dignity of a member of the community who has fallen under the judgment of God, right, David? It seems to be kind of obvious, although it's, it's easy to say 
but it appears is that being caned, stoned, whipped, whatever, you don't want that. That's exactly so right. Don't break the law. Yeah. It's a profound deterrent. Profound course, deterrent. Me, yeah. Of course, you know? You think, see. Listen. Some people, but it also shows how broken people can be if they're really desperate that they'll take that chance and they pay that price. You, do you remember? Uh, there, there were actually a couple of cases like this, but I remember one in particular in Singapore when I was probably 12 or 13 years old. This is in the early 90s. Um, and uh, the young man is caught stealing road signs. Remember, he got caned, right? And how so many of the news outlets, this is so barbaric, and this is just so... And it, I remember my dad thinking, that's not very barbaric, you know? That, that kid has not been permanently harmed. He's not permanently disabled. He's humiliated, and he's in significant pain, Right? But guess what? Don't steal street signs. You, you know? I mean, this, and he didn't, I'm, I would assume, after that. So, again, there is, uh, there is an appropriateness in this. We think about this being barbaric. Let me tell you something. I, I, would, I, I would rather that we be caning those young men rather than incarcerating them where they're learning more bad habits. <laughs> okay? Uh, that's just me, and I'm probably getting myself in trouble, so I'll stop there. Um, I've given you some notes about uh, integrity with regard to commerce and business dealings. I'm not going to unpack that. I'm just going to let you read that. Okay. Uh, let's talk about violent crimes. Crimes involving injury and liability. Premeditated or intentional murder was a capital offense. No ransom was to be accepted for the murderer. The law demanded his execution. That required this testimony of two or three witnesses. There was a, a, an extensive process to ensure that this person is actually guilty. But if he's guilty, he ought to die. Why? Because human life is the image of God, right? Human beings enjoy life in the image of God, and only God has the right to take that life. And that's what's happening when a murderer is executed, by the way. God is exercising judgment by means of the civil magistrate. Sandy? That's correct. And God's law says we kill them and then they go to him and he deals with them yes. in judgment. Yes, but as much as I want to affirm the, the spirit of what you're saying, I do want to say this is one of the principles where general equity has to guide us. Because what I would say is God's law does say as part of the moral law that murder is a capital crime. Genesis chapter 9 verses 5 and 6 Romans chapter 13, verse 4, is based on the same principle, okay? So that's transcendent. How do we deal with a rapist? The only guidance we have is the civil law of Moses, and I cannot, as a minister, stand up and say, the civil law of Israel has to be the civil law of Arizona, right? What I can say, on the basis of the general equity, right, is that there is guidance here in thinking through how to apply the moral law. But I can't say that as a transcendent moral principle, God has prescribed the death penalty for all of the things that it is prescribed for in the law of Moses. Does that make sense? Well, I do think the point that you're making is very good, is that if you look at the fruit of the system that we've created, a lot of that's bad fruit, right? Now, that, listen, our judicial system is to be preferred to any other option on the planet right now, okay? Definitely. And yet, exactly, it creates recidivism, you know, however you say that. Repetition. Thank you. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 21 is really fascinating in terms of murder because God says that, that murder pollutes the land, okay? Bloodshed pollutes the land. And if there is an unsolved murder, or a murder where you cannot get a conviction for the murderer. You may know who it is, right? But you have insufficient evidence to convict the murderer. The elders of the city that is closest to the body, the site of that crime, there is a process whereby sacrifices are to be offered and atonement made for that bloodshed. Now, if if unavenged blood cries out from the ground for vengeance, 
which is what we see consistently from Genesis chapter 4 all the way through Revelation chapter 6, where the blood of the martyrs is crying out to God for vengeance. What does the blood of 55 million aborted babies over the last 40 years cry out for? That's something to think about, right? Uh, God takes that very, very seriously. The laws regarding manslaughter, I already mentioned. There's provision with regard to the cities of refuge where a man who inadvertently took another person's life was responsible for that death. But he was not treated as a murderer, nor should he be. That would be unjust. If you or the law today does not make distinctions between intentional and in an unintentional uh, homicide, then you're not making distinctions that God himself made in the law of Moses. Uh, Exodus 21, we actually studied this uh, case law uh, in our discussion of abortion a few months ago. Accidental violent to, violence to a pregnant woman. Uh, if, uh, if two men are fighting, a pregnant woman is, is hit somehow, affected by this. She goes into labor, the baby's born, everybody's fine. Then the offender who struck her is fined. He comes under a judicial penalty, but in this case it's a financial penalty. But if harm follows, he pays according to the principle of justice. Life for life, eye for eye, hand for hand, foot for foot. Kidnapping was a capital offense punishable by death. This is where judicial discretion ought to be exercised. Because I can imagine scenarios in which kidnapping is not really kidnapping, except that it's kidnapping, right? You think about custody disputes and things of that nature. But let me tell you something. Somebody who takes another person's child or captures another person, takes them hostage or kidnaps them in some way, and, and under the law of Moses was to be put to death. And that doesn't seem like a bad idea to me. Um, sex crimes, uh, very serious offenses, okay? And here again, judicial discretion would have been involved. For instance, this, is, this by the way, is where uh, atheists try to make a lot of hay against the ethic of the Bible. And they will say, see, you've got girls being raped and then being forced to marry their rapist. I'm sorry, that is not taught in the book of Deuteronomy. You're an unbeliever and you don't know how to read the Bible, okay? Uh, there, is, there is a lack of understanding of context there. But nevertheless... These crimes were treated very seriously. So, for instance, you have a young woman who gets married who is promiscuous prior to the marriage. This is particularly true if it's during the betrothal period where functionally, legally, she is married, but the marriage has not been consummated. She's sleeping around. She could be put to death. That's a big deal. That's not the same scenario where a young woman falls into sin, is penitent, and later has the opportunity to marry. That's not the kind of scenario that is being described in that part of Deuteronomy. How do you know that? Because you've got more than just Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is law code. The rest of the Old Testament is showing us the application of many of these laws, right? Rahab is not put to death for having been a prostitute. Why? Because she's a penitent convert. That makes a difference, right? But impenitent promiscuous behavior was a serious thing. By the way, a husband who thought to accuse his wife of infidelity, if that was a false charge, that was a big deal too. You don't want to be that guy, right? Handling of rape or instances of sexual immorality differed according to the circumstances. Adultery, for instance, would usually result in the execution of both parties. This is one of the reasons, probably, why Jesus handles the exception clauses in Matthew 5 and Matthew 19 the way that he does. Because the partner who is impenitently immoral is, from the standpoint of the divine law, dead. Right? And therefore the innocent party has the right to remarry. Um, if a betrothed virgin was raped in the field, only the rapist would be executed. Deuteronomy describes this. Why? Because there is an assumption that she's resisting. There is an assumption. The law gives her the benefit of the doubt. She said no. And nobody, nobody was there to hear her. She cried for help. 
and there was nobody to come to her rescue. The law gives her the benefit of the doubt. On the other hand, a betrothed woman who makes an accusation of rape in the city and there is no evidence that there was rape or that she resisted at all, she could be implicated in that. She could be accused of making a false charge. She could be accused of now having committed sexual immorality and trying to call it rape. She could be executed along with the rapist. Now that's a serious thing. This again is where context plays plays an important role in understanding what's going on here. You say, that doesn't seem right. This young woman, she did nothing wrong. No, that's the point. She did something wrong. Because the law assumes that she is going to resist. You say, well, what if she couldn't resist? He was stronger than her. Okay, the law is not faulting her for that. But what the law is doing is saying a false accusation of rape when it was actually consensual in the city is a big no-no. That's wrong. And she can be punished as a result of that. The one that atheists like to go to most often, and I've given you the citation in the text, is an unbetrothed virgin, right? Here, a man finds an unbetrothed virgin, takes her, lies with her, he can be fined, and then he has to marry her. No, you're not reading that correctly. First of all, you're assuming that this is rape, when in fact what you're probably seeing is seduction, okay? Uh, If an uncommitted, unengaged, unbetrothed woman is seduced by a man, what happens? He is fined according to her father's judgment. Wow. Do you know if you read the whole book, you'll learn that their marriage is based upon the father's consent. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. What kind of scenario is being allowed for here? Back seat of a car. Okay. This is a young woman and her boyfriend going too far. Well, no harm, no foul. Wrong. <laughs> because now, Daddy and the city elders set this young man down and say, Guess what? You just bought a wife. And this is what it's going to cost you. If that young woman has actually been raped, her dad does not consent to that marriage. That's not the scenario that's being envisioned. What's being envisioned is a situation of seduction where she may very well have been a willing partner in this. Are they put to death for that? No. But what happens? He pays a fine and they get hitched if dad says that's what needs to happen. That doesn't seem too bad to me. That doesn't seem like a barbaric law to me. And yet that is one of the most common examples that atheists will critique with regard to to the civil law. Does that make sense? Okay, now the other favorite whipping boy in the Mosaic Code is the law that uh, Debbie brought up just a minute ago. It relates to questions of assault. This is particularly in Exodus 21 and 22, but there's also some information in Deuteronomy about this and Leviticus chapter 24. Basically, the principle of justice is this. If you assault another person but don't kill them, whatever you did to them is what's about to be done to you. You punched a guy in the face and knocked out one of his teeth. Guess what the law is going to do to you, right? You assaulted a man and cut off his hand. You assaulted a man and injured his leg. That is what is going to be done to you. Now, there are some other scenarios that are addressed. For instance, if a person assaults their parents, they're put to death. They can also be put to death for cursing their parents. It's a really big deal. It's the fifth commandment, right? Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long. Because literally, to dishonor your parents in that way could mean it could cost you your life. If a man was disabled by an injury, then his assailant would not only suffer the same penalty in his person, but he would also pay disability wages to that man until he has recovered. That doesn't sound unjust, does it? That doesn't sound wrong or unfair. If a man beat and killed one of his slaves, the man who beat the slave was to be punished. He was not necessarily executed. But he was punished according to judicial discretion in that particular scenario. If he beat the slave and the slave survived, then no penalty was attached. 
Atheists are profoundly offended by that, and unfortunately some Christians are offended by that. So let's talk about this. This has a historical context. The world in which this law was given had slavery. So did Jesus' world. That's why the apostles address it. Um, Slavery in the ancient Near East was not like slavery in our American history. Our slavery was based on kidnapping, and it was race-based, and it was frequently, although maybe not always, but frequently abusive. It was a horrible institution. Thank God that it's gone. But that's not the slavery that you read about in the Bible. The slavery that you read about in the Bible is of a very different character. But nevertheless, there is slavery. And slavery itself per se is not regarded in either Old or New Testaments as immoral in and of itself. What is regulated is not the existence of slavery, but the practice of slavery. Now what's happening here in Exodus chapter 21 is a man who is disciplining a rebellious or disobedient slave, and the slave says, that's assault. No, it's not. He beat you, you recovered, you are his property. You work for him. It's not the same scenario as one man beating another man who is his fellow citizen. Now, you and I can say, well, that just doesn't seem right. Okay, well, we could talk about that, we could think about that. But that is the scenario that the law describes. And I want you to give give you some New Testament context for this, right? A Christian by the name of Philemon in the city of Colossae has a slave who runs away. Everything that we know about Philemon suggests that Onesimus does not run away because Philemon's a bad guy, that he's abusive or something like that. Paul praises Philemon very highly. Onesimus happens to run, coincidentally of course, into the Apostle Paul uh, during his flight from Philemon, and he is converted. And you know what Paul does? He sends him back. Do you know why? Because Philemon owns Onesimus. That's an apostle recognizing that. Joseph is a slave in the house of Potiphar. He recognizes he has responsibility to his master. We could could pile up examples of this in Scripture. Okay, You and I are offended by the idea of one human being having mastery over another because we have grown up in an American culture that conditions us to view slavery solely in the context of our own history of slavery. That's not the context of slavery in the ancient world. And to read the Bible's teaching about slavery in light of the American experience of slavery is to read it anachronistically. In other words, it's to read back into Scripture something that Scripture is not describing at all. Does that make sense? A man is not allowed to abuse his slave. If he kills his slave, he is punished. He is a criminal, right? But a man who disciplines his slave and the slave is fine, the slave recovers, that's not a crime in the law's eyes, right? And again, that is not a deficient morality. That is a historically situated regulation. Randy? had to be different in that it's more servitude than slavery. That's exactly right. Actually, they they could be adopted. (laughs) Yeah. And then they did have laws that if their time was up and they wanted to stay with their master, so it couldn't have been an abusive arrangement like we had here. Same chapter describes the slave. Remember, every seven years the slave goes free. It's less if they're, if they're closer to the, to the seventh year, right? Uh, and and the, the same text, the same passage describes the slave that at the end of his time says, no, no, I want to remain your slave forever. Okay, we go over to the doorpost, you take an owl, you give him a, a, a pierced ear, and he, why would anybody ever do that? Because the slavery in that world, in that time, was not the same thing that you and I think of as slavery, okay? And you have to be so careful that you read historical texts in their historical context. Don't import modern constructs back into ancient context, right? 
And, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not thereby advocating slavery as an institution. I'm perfectly happy that we don't have slavery today. But what I am saying is that the slavery you're reading about in Exodus and Deuteronomy is profoundly different in nature than the slavery that you and I are familiar with in our own historical um, context, right? Yes, I'm sorry, Nancy. <laughs> you know, there are actually a lot of parallels to uh, uh, Randy or whoever uh, just said. The, the slavery in, in this world looks more like what we think of as servanthood, right? Uh, indentured service or even an employee-employer relation. Now, it's not identical, but it has far more in common with that than what we think of as slavery. And so I do think that there are parallels there, absolutely. Yeah. I am out of time, and I am not out of material here. Um, thank you. Yes. Um, there's a, there are a number of things about liability. Um, I, some of the laws with regard to theft here are actually brilliant, uh, much better than the system that we have today. I really need to talk really, really, really quickly. If you'll, if you'll give me just a few minutes grace here tonight, let me say two things and then, and then I'll let you take it home. One is about the lex talionis, the law of retaliation. So many people misunderstand this that I think we do a disservice to our study tonight if we don't mention this. What people misunderstand is Jesus' uh, interpretation of this in Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If any man wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile with him, go with him too. Right? And so people, these enlightened Christians today, will say, see, Jesus thought that an eye for an eye was a terrible thing. Wrong. Um, Jesus experiences hell on the cross for you. And that is according to the principle of <laughs> Lex Talionis. If you read Revelation, you're actually going to see God doing this with the nations. Repaying them according to their sins. It is a basic principle of justice. The punishment is supposed to fit the crime. You ever heard that? That's the Lex Talionis. That principle of justice, I'm sorry folks, did not expire with the Mosaic system. That's just a principle of justice. That's part of the general equity that we're about to talk about. Okay? And what Jesus does in Matthew chapter 5 is he objects to the exercise or the application of that principle in terms of personal revenge. You can search Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy in vain to find justification for that principle to be used in exercising personal revenge. That's not what it was. It was the guiding principle for the elders of the community to mete out punishment based on the offense. And the Jews of Jesus' day turned that into a license to take revenge. And Jesus says that is not the spirit that is to characterize God's people. Jesus is not objecting to that principle in the law. He is correcting a rabbinic perversion of that law. Does that make sense? There's a lot more we could say about that, but I'm going to let that suffice for now so that I can say the second thing, which is the general equity. The reason I use that term is that's the terminology that's used in chapter 19 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. It has a long and rich history. Uh, you may read that part of the confession and wonder, what in the world is the general equity? Well, it's the general principle of fairness, of justice, that is encoded within the civil law. So if you say... Of what value is this civil law if, in fact, it was only for Israel at a particular time in her history? What does it matter today? Why should we study this material at all? Here is the reason. The civil law that God gave to Israel in Canaan in a particular time and in a particular context was merely a local historical application of the basic principles of justice and righteousness that apply to every nation under heaven. 
Now, that does not mean that you can create a one-to-one correspondence between the law in Deuteronomy and what ought to be the law of America, okay? And, and this is important. You know, there are laws in Deuteronomy that ought not to be laws in America. But the same principles of justice that undergird those laws in Deuteronomy ought to undergird our, our laws today. And that is the principle of general equity. Now, this requires some discernment, shockingly, right? This is not as simple as simply reading a verse and saying, boom, that's what God's law says, that's what we ought to do. Wait a second. <laughs> Don't rip a scripture out of context, right? In some cases, it is that simple. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That means people should not commit adultery, right? Um, but how does the law work through that in a civil context? Well, it's not as simple as pulling something out of Leviticus chapter 18 or Deuteronomy and just slapping it into our modern law code. But what Leviticus and Deuteronomy help us to do is to think carefully through that. And to say, how did God work through those issues in that context? And how can that be properly applied in our own context? Now, again, I, and, and I'm departing somewhat with, with some of my Reformed brethren, right, who think that the law that God gave to Moses ought to be, is not obviously, but ought to be, uh, the civil order that, all, uh, that is uh, obeyed by all nations. Um, I don't think that that's correct. And, and part of the, the primary reason I don't think that is that Jesus does not seem to understand the law in that way. And Paul and Peter certainly don't seem to understand the law in that way. They're, they're not trying to reform Rome in light of Deuteronomy, right? Their aim is to preach the gospel. I'm not concerned about trying to get America's laws to look like the book of Deuteronomy, okay? And therefore, I'm not necessarily going to go out and campaign for homosexuals to be stoned, right? But what I am going to argue is that the general equity of God's moral law should, in every age and in every nation, recognize that sexual immorality ought not to be promoted by the civil magistrate, but ought to be condemned, ought to be proscribed. I cannot go to Deuteronomy and say America ought to execute certain offenders based upon the law that God gave to Israel. But I can go to Deuteronomy and say, look how seriously God takes these particular crimes. How then ought our nation to handle some of those same offenses? Does that make sense? So that requires discernment. That requires study. And, and, and there will be, uh, recognize this, there will be differences of opinion even among Christians as to what extent or how that general equity ought to be worked out in any given scenario. But what we all ought to recognize is that there is a principle of fairness and righteousness and morality that is unchanging, right? And, and it's not okay for our nation to suddenly up and say, you know what, uh, two men who love each other and want to get married, they can get married. No, they can't. Well, why not? You're just wanting to go back to the barbaric laws of Deuteronomy. No, it's, that's not really the point, right? The point is that God decides what marriage is. And God in every age and in every society has the same rule with regard to that, right? Now, He doesn't with regard to having a parapet around the roof of your house or plowing your fields with two different kinds of animals, you know. Uh, he doesn't have those same rules for every civil society or civil institution under heaven. But there are certain transcendent moral principles that are encoded within that law. And, and where Deuteronomy is so helpful is saying, how did the people of God, or how were they supposed to? Obviously, they didn't always do it. In fact, I think they rarely did it. But, uh, but how were they supposed to apply the moral law? in terms of their civil commonwealth. And then we need to wrestle with how do we do the same today. Does that make sense? Okay, Any, thank you for giving me that, that grace. And uh, that, that, that will allow us to just kind of finish this. And then we will uh, go on next week. All right, Randy. In, in trying to apply those laws today, it's interesting to see during the years of silence, yes. when the Jews created laws on top of laws to not break yeah. Law. They had so perverted the law that by the time Christ came, people just thought about it tonight as you're given a law and thought about what happened in Christ's day, 
how many things were broken just concerning him. Absolutely. So to bring those laws into our nation today without Holy Spirit influence in that is impossible. It would be, it would be impossible. It would be a nightmare. Absolutely. And, and by the way, uh, and again, not trying to, not trying to uh, get myself in trouble, I wouldn't want America to function as a theocracy. Absolutely not. I would not want them to, uh, I would not want our government to decide uh, to execute false prophets, for instance. Right? Because it would really be bad then when those in positions of power are unorthodox. And that's happened in the history of the church. Right? And that's where persecution has arisen even from within the church against Christians. Right? I, and, and honestly, if I thought that the Bible compelled me to say, no, America, rightly ordered under God, ought to be a theocracy, I don't believe that that's what the Bible teaches, right? Uh, that, that is, an, in my judgment, an over-realized eschatology. It's trying to take the ultimate end of the new heavens and the new earth and, and apply it back into the present evil age. It's an evil age, right? And in an evil age, you're going to have a less than ideal uh, civil order, Right? But a civil order that nevertheless should recognize that God is the ultimate lawgiver. Okay? All right, let's finish up with prayer. Heavenly Father, we're indeed thankful that you love us and that you have revealed your word for our instruction and for our good. We recognize, Father, in these laws that you gave to your nation of Israel through your servant Moses, we recognize in these laws those transcendent principles of justice that should obligate and do obligate us all. And we see your wisdom, Father, and we see that there is nothing evil in your law at all. And yet, before your law, we all stand convicted because we have sinned and we do fall short of your glory. And we give you thanks, Father, that your Son, Jesus, came into this world and took its brokenness upon Himself and perfectly fulfilled Your law and suffered for the sins of Your people and rose the third day victorious over sin and death and reigns now at Your right hand. And we're thankful for the hope that we have secured in Him because of that great work. We do pray, Father, that within our own nation You might raise up God-fearing men to influence our government for good, that they might honor not the particular laws that we may study in Deuteronomy that were given to Israel, but will nevertheless honor that basic moral law that you have given to all people that you have made under heaven. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to bless us in this series of studies and that it would enlarge our vision of your holiness and the perfection of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.